All right, let's get started. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Urs Gasser. I'm the executive director of the Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society here at Harvard. Um, I have the great pleasure um, to welcome all of you to this very special, very happy celebratory event, uh, a panel in celebration of Mike Klein's most generous gift to what was formerly known the Berkman Center and now is the Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society. It is a great honor uh, to welcome you back on campus, uh, Mike, together with your wife, uh, Joan. Uh, we couldn't be more grateful for, for this fantastic gift, and uh, we'll uh, talk more about it later today. Uh, for this first part of the event, however, I'd simply like to introduce another uh, close friend and supporter of the Burton Klein Center, uh, John Palfrey, uh, who's the head of school at Phillips Academy in Andover, uh, who is a very long friend and collaborator, uh, who also serves as a co-director of the Berkman Klein Center, uh, among many other positions he has. He was previously the um, uh, a professor here at, at Harvard Law School, and hopefully one day will come back. Uh, and John kindly agreed uh, to this uh, to moderate this fantastic panel, which is actually an all-star panel uh, on the topic of power and participation in the networked public sphere. Thank you so much, John, for your willingness uh, to be with us today. Of course, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for being here as part of this celebration. Thank you in particular to Mike Klein and to Joan. Thank you for being here on this celebratory day. This is an amazing moment for the Berkman Klein Center, an amazing moment for Harvard University, and of course, for Harvard Law School as well. We're thrilled that you are here, and thank you for making all of this possible. Um, this is a really, really wonderful moment where I think we can, uh, we can reflect on what is not quite 20 years of work that started way back when, and I hope that Jonathan Zittrin, one of our founders, and Charlie Nesson, one of our founders, will um, take some time today also to tell us about some founding stories, um, to talk about what's happened mm -hmm. in the interim, and then also to talk about what is to come and what we'll be able to do with this amazing platform. Uh, I'm going to turn it over very, very uh, quickly to the panel, but I did want to reflect just, just briefly with Mike here um, to thank you for the ability for all of us to have the power that these centers afford us to do this work. I can think of no environment, no teaching and learning environment, no environment with colleagues greater than the one that the Berkman uh, Klein Center affords. And I think this is a topic that is so central in so many ways to so many different fields. Uh, and the gift of being able to do this just personally has been so meaningful. Uh, and I know that many of the people who have come back here, I see so many friends and graduates of the school and alumni of the center in various ways. It is amazing what, um, what you and the Berkman family have made possible. So thank you for that, and it'll be fun to dig into it. So thank you again. We are going to uh, take maybe five to seven minutes with each of the panelists off the start, and then they will uh, no doubt have comments for one another, and then we will open it up for all of you. There are microphones, so have your questions and comments ready, and I'm sure this will be very lively. Since the topic is power and participation in the network public sphere, I figured we should start off with something a little bit definitional. And in fact, the man who coined the term, the network public sphere, is on the stage in Yochai Benkler. Um, Yochai, uh, faculty member here, well known um, for his work in lots of areas related to this topic. Yochai, I wonder if you might start out helping us think about the network public sphere as a concept, um, and then, uh, as you like, head into power and participation as well. Sure. Um, so again, let me join everyone in thanking you, Mike, and, and thanking everyone for coming here to uh, help celebrate uh, a new degree of freedom for the center to do the work we do. Uh, with all this amazing network of people uh, coming together to talk and learn and think. Um, the network public sphere is a way of thinking about the cluster of technologies and practices we use to talk to each other about what matters to us, to decide uh, what counts as true 
or untrue, what counts as persuasive or unpersuasive, what counts as relevant to political debate and not relevant to political debate. Um, and it's very much intended as a contradistinction to what characterized uh, public discourse through much of the 20th century organized around mass media, whether state-owned and controlled in many countries, whether market-owned and market-cleared in the US uh, as we knew it. And the whole structure, if you think of media studies and political communication in that developed in the mid to late 20th century, organized itself around this fact that to speak required a platform and the owner of the platform was a commercial entity that might use its platform power to affect the political uh, agenda or might use it to sell it to someone else for advertising and in very imperfect markets. And that was the entire debate. The network public sphere really tries to capture the idea that the net broke open that particular set of bottlenecks and allowed both market and non-market, both state and non-state actors to participate <laughs> and be able to actually exert power over each other, debate, argue, change the narrative, primarily around the question of framing a debate, saying what counts, what is happening, what counts as important, and mobilizing for action. So if you just look at the last, at, at last week, the confrontation between Keith Scott's family and uh, the police over uh, the videos, over the, over the police videos. The fact that Keith Scott's wife already embeds in her practice, she has a phone. She is every much of a videographer and a video journalist as is the journalist. She has the capacity to capture to tell the story, and she knows that there are multiple ways around which no one can block to be able to actually communicate. That's the source both of decentralization of power to shape the narrative, to shape how we frame the question, um, and the, that emerges from the physical devices through to the network architectures. But we also know that if that was the ideal opportunity, it's always been contested. In the first generation, it was contested very much by 20th century incumbents, whether it's telco carriers who wanted to control, whether it's media companies who controlled through copyright, and a lot of the battle was around opening up those affordances vis-a-vis -vis the 20th century incumbents. I think a lot of what we've been seeing now is the emergence of new points of control, new points of power. So if we continue with the same thing, theme, when Corinne Gaines tries to actually do the same thing and harness a live audience to stream her encounter with the police as a way of protecting herself from being shot, her account is shut down. And we learn that Facebook has an interface with the police. She ends up dead. We don't know what happened in those particular seconds. So there's no utopian, one-directional decentralization of power. And decentralization of power itself is not necessarily utopian. In a study we're doing now with Media Cloud on looking at the election, it's very clear that all that on the online debate on immigration, Breitbart is one of the major voices larger than most of mainstream media. It's not clear valence right or left. It's just widely distributed power to work around concentrations of power, some 20th century and some that are emerging in new. Jokai, thank you. What a great start. And I feel I find you everywhere. I was reading this past week a book called Free Speech by Timothy Garton Ash, which is looking at the history of free expression and how it fits in this connected world. And he very much builds it on top of you and the network public sphere. So you are everywhere. Your theories are, uh, are pervading our work. And I'm excited to hear some back and forth, especially on some of those power and participation points, too. Intisar Rab, I might turn to you next. Um, Intisar Rab is a professor of law here at Harvard Law School and uh, a scholar in a number of related fields and also the head of a center that is also here at Harvard Law School. And I think your work on Sharia source and many things that uh, link together Harvard Law School's faculty uh, through the Berkman Klein Center is just a great inspiration. We are delighted that you are part of the Berkman community. And I wonder if you might reflect on your work and how it relates to power and participation in the network public sphere. Well, thank you, and I, I join in, in 
Starting out with the congratulations and, and thank you for making this all possible uh, to my client and all of you that are here. Um, because the Berkman Klein Center has been, as you said, very instrumental um, and essential to uh, building up this project, which I've been thinking about for a long time, called Sharia Source, which is housed at the Islamic Legal Studies Program uh, here at the law school and, uh, and sort of built uh, in combination um, or with support from the Berkman Klein Center. And so I want to tell you, uh, uh, before I tell you exactly um, what the project is, a little bit about uh, how it emerged uh, to give an idea of, of uh, what it is. So uh, Sharia Source uh, came uh, from, in part, studying uh, Islamic law alongside American law and having a lot of ease in studying and understanding American law through being able to log on to Westlaw, uh, LexisNexis, Bloomberg, now Google even, uh, but not having a way of doing the same thing for Islamic law very easily. There was simply no access to sources on Islamic law. And uh, so I thought, what if we had such a source? What if we could build something like a Westlaw for Islamic law a Google for Islamic law. And that's the, the basic idea of Sharia source. But then, um, and related to this theme of, of power and participation in the network uh, uh, public sphere, it didn't seem enough to just have access to resources for people like me that were interested in it, could read uh, the sources in their original languages, but it seemed that there also was a need in the public sphere um, for more participation um, or access to understanding what these uh, Islamic law materials or debates were even about. What was, what is Sharia in the first place? I got calls from uh, newspapers asking this question as it comes up in the news and in uh, uh, policy circles and foreign policy debates. Um, can you explain what Sharia is and, and um, is ISIS Islamic? There was a famous Graham Wood article, which apparently was the most read Atlantic article ever um, with that title. Uh, and there, there was a debate about, you know, is ISIS Islamic and what is the Sharia or Islamic law that was behind it? Um, and then the third uh, uh, call that I got was actually to go uh, to help, uh, to go to Brunei to help uh, some understanding, help garner some understanding for American politicians and policymakers and members of the public as to what Islamic criminal law was, which is something that, that I've written about that I'm very interested in. Um, because the, um, in a bizarre turn of events, the Sultan of Brunei who owned Hotel California uh, had just passed an Islamic criminal law code, and so there were protests in California outside of, of the, this famous hotel um, because there was a fear that uh, any Islamic criminal law code would necessarily discriminate uh, against people. Uh, and would that be the case? Were there Islamic uh, criminal procedures that might help guide that legal system. And so I, I went to look into that and that related to the TPP's ability to pass because Brunei was uh, one of the 14 uh, countries that was part of, of the T -T TPP deal and the emergence of Islamic criminal law in the mix that no one understood um, and thought to be all bad and, and perhaps it would be bad if applied uh, in sort of the draconian ways that we, we see about in the, the, in the news. Um, but from my research, that's not, that's, that's not the only way that it can be applied, and there are certainly constraints that uh, the criminal procedures would impose on draconian applications of the law. So things like that, uh, to me, uh, you know, sort of highlighted the relevance of Islamic law and in understanding what it is in ways that can really affect not only the research areas that I'm interested in and, and a lot of the academics here are interested in, um, but beyond that, a broader public conversation where others can participate 
uh, in the debate. And what I wanted to do with Sharia Source is basically make available both the sources on which Islamic law and all of, all of its diversity uh, is based and then also have an opportunity for scholars to engage one another and, and the public. And so, uh, so we, we try to do that through building out a portal, really engaging people and, and, and then sort of publicizing or creating programming about it that, that might help inform public conversations about Islamic law. So all these P's here, uh, participation, uh, network public age, and, and the portal, and, and, and the, the, the people that are involved, um, is basically what Sharia Source is about. Thank you. That's a wonderful story and, a, and just a great, I think, instantiation of what this idea 19 years ago or so could grow into and has grown into. And my little story, remembering when I was five or six years ago, I think I heard from Dean Minow that a wonderful BC law scholar was going to come over here and visit for a bit. And I was in charge of the library at the time. And the librarians were so excited that this amazing library of Islamic law would be used in a particular way. And you came down and were burrowing through all of those works and then clearly had this idea that you could take that work that was buried in the basement of a library and make it alive in these important ways at this crucial moment in our history. So it's amazing what you're doing. And I'm glad Thank you're doing you. it. I love with, our library. With the Berkman Klein Center. Our library is amazing. And, and to make it even, even even more accessible through your work is wonderful. Uh, Zainab Tuchaki, you are one of the uh, people who can expand this conversation yet further. Um, one of the things I know that we all celebrate so much about the Berkman Center is a combination of people who have been here as fellows and also who are faculty members at other universities and who expand the reach. And I've always felt this has been one of the most special parts of the Berkman Center. Certainly under URSA's leadership and others, it's expanded even more in this way, particularly internationally. Um, you've done so much work, of course, thinking about Turkey in particular, but many other environments. Um, and that story of the network public sphere, I think, is absolutely undergirding the work that you've done that's so important. So maybe if you could react to the prompt sure. of power and participation in the network public sphere. And welcome back to Harvard Law School. Thank you. So um, I want to start by saying the network public sphere has been life-changing for me personally because I grew up in Turkey under the military regime instituted under the last coup, not the last one, but the one and a half before, <laughs> sorry, my part of the world. Um, and, I, and I became a computer programmer because as a teenager, I needed to find a job very quickly, and I knew some programming, and I wanted to pick a job that had no ethical implications. Because <laughs> I was interested in science, yeah. and I thought physics, nuclear bombs, medical, there's all this genetics. So I thought, let me pick a clean thing that'll get me employed without any ethical issues. That didn't so, work out too well, did it? So this yeah. is uh, to handicap anything I say. I'm not good at this, <laughs> guessing the future. Um, it turned out to be very important to me because I started working at IBM because of that, which had the intranet before the internet was in Turkey. So I was this teenage programmer that IBM reluctantly hired. They hid me from upper management for a long time because they had to do this multi-country thing and they had an intranet. Um, and there I got the network public sphere within a company and it blew my mind because in Turkey there was only the television station and showed only, it was censored and it showed only US media. So we watched Little House on the Prairie, mm -hmm. which my part of the world makes no sense because there is no middle of nowhere in Turkey. <laughs> Anything you are, there's 5,000 years of history and more. Uh, so <laughs> but they didn't want to tell us what was happening in the southeast part of the Turkey. So we watched Laura Ingalls instead. In IBM, I, I thought this is going to change the world because here I am, like IBM's upper management doesn't know I work here because I'm a teenage girl and that's not okay yet, but I'm collaborating with 26 countries to localize something, something that pays the bills, never mind that part. Mm -hmm. But, so I switched to sociology from computers and I said I'm going to do the social side of it. People thought I was crazy, probably was. Mm -hmm. Then I came here to do my master's, coincidental personal connections. And people thought I was crazy, because what is this internet society, computer science, sociology, how do they connect? I got a PhD, and I got hired in spite of what I studied, because I could do statistics and stuff. People were like, all right, we'll just let her do our statistics. In fact, that's how I paid my way through everything till then. 
And then Facebook came along and people started changing their minds about whether this was relevant or not. And then I found Berkman. It was the first time in my intellectual life I wasn't homeless. <laughs> there were all these people who were working and thinking about all of this stuff before we were talking and thinking about it in any formal way. And what I've done since has been kind of just expanding this collaboration that I found for the first time, literally in Berkman, the first time in my life that I was welcomed for what I was interested in and not tolerated despite the weirdness. <laughs> Uh, it wasn't Berkman, so I want to thank the Berkman community and thank you for making it on a more strong footing because I can't imagine something we need more, an independent mind into the network public sphere. And I'll tell you guys one story about what's at stake, and this will go from everything you guys have been saying, and that's my research into uh, Facebook's role, because we talked about Facebook too um, a minute ago, on the network public sphere. So about two and a half years ago, in August of 13th, 14th, on my Twitter feed, I started noticing these Ferguson protests that were kind of bubbling, and we all kind of know what happened since, but at the time they were really small, and uh, this teenager had been killed, and there was a grieving community, and the police department showed up with military-grade armor. Now, I have a lot of friends all around the world, and I started tweeting these pictures we were seeing from uh, Ferguson protests, which was these armored vehicles with snipers on top, and my Egyptian friends were like, are you guys okay? You know, I know, but my Bahraini friends were, this is very familiar. So what happened was, on Twitter, which is part of the network public sphere, but not algorithmically filtered, the story dominated the whole conversation. And then two journalists who were charging their Wi-Fi, and they were accessing Wi-Fi and charging their computers at McDonald's, which is a common scene from protests around the world, got disappeared by the Ferguson Police Department, which got a lot more, they literally just picked them up and uh, illegally arrested them, apparently. Um, which got, you know, my Egyptian friends were like, free Wesley, can we start a hashtag and trend it? <laughs> so at this point, I switched to Facebook to see what my friends on Facebook were saying about this. And the conversation was absolutely absent on Facebook. I switched back to Twitter, like everybody's talking about it. I thought maybe my Facebook friends are kind of not talking about it. Well, it turned out after much research, uh, which has since been implicitly confirmed by Facebook, Facebook's algorithm was smothering the Ferguson news because it, at the moment, very much like the ALS ice bucket challenge, which was people dumping ice water on their heads, mm -hmm. uh, which was very algorithm friendly. And had it not been for this unfiltered Twitter, because mass media wasn't covering much either, it's plausible to me to imagine a counterfactual world in which the movement that has since brought so many painful but necessary conversations to the public sphere to the state could it have been smothered in the beginning? Maybe. The rate of police killings, we don't really have great statistics from 2014 before, but NAACP thinks that they're steady. So it just might be our ability to hear and the ability of a people to get together and say, look at this, and to document this is what's changed. But there's nothing as you say, you know, it's not like good or bad. I like to say it's not the, you know, Thor Sammer, the internet's not Thor Sammer, only the purest of heart can pick up and only do good things mm -hmm. with. It's a very complex moment, and there's a lot of power at stake, because there's a lot of money at stake. And we now have machine intelligence coming into the space and making decisions. And there are very few places where I see this kind of conversation happening because if you are near Silicon Valley, I was there last week, every table in the restaurant was talking about valuations of their stock, every single table. Um, the critical eye is difficult from the pull of so much money. And so it's only, the, and academia moves on its own pace. It's these centers that do the work of what kind of a network public sphere do we have what kind of things could we have? What's the you know, space of alternatives? And to understand this power that's unleashed all over the world, for good or bad, my part of the world, it's parts of it are a nightmare, and parts of it are very liberating. Um, 
I was in Gezi Park protests. I documented them, I studied them, I tear gassed them, and I tweeted through them. I ended up live tweeting a coup. It's a crazy world in some ways and it's just beginning, so I'm super pleased to be in this conversation and to have this opportunity to try to think independently and critically about where are we going and what else could we be doing, so. Sainam, thank you, and thank you for giving voice to the Fellows Program, to your own experience, and to everything you've observed. It was amazing and, for me. So thank you. And I, I get my, my news about Turkey primarily from your Twitter feed, just to be clear. So keep it up, please. It's very helpful and better than CNN. I better hope I don't like to eat another coup. That yeah, was not true. planned. That, that sounded, <laughs> sounded like a hard thing. Catherine Bracey, over to you as the penultimate panelist. Um, you, this is going back a little bit in time since you and I started working for the Berkman Center on exactly the same day. Um, which was I think I started two weeks before. Did you? You had me beat. Yeah. All right. Very well. It's I like which corrected. twin was born sooner. <laughs> this, is, this is actually part and parcel of our relationship, so thank you. I'm corrected appropriately <laughs> by my friend Catherine Bracey. We were in Pound Hall at that time and moved very quickly over uh, to a new space. Um, you, within the context of the Berkman Center, did, I think, every job along the way before um, you escaped. We were very sad about that, but you went to the West Coast. Um, and have done so many interesting things since then, both in terms of politics, using the network public sphere in a literal way. You've also done it in the context of Code for America. You are now doing this interesting work in tech equity in the Bay Area. Maybe you could give your reaction to the importance of the power and participation in the public sphere. Yes, I'm from that alien land on the West Coast where all anyone talks about is valuations. valuations. Um, like restaurant. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, I must admit that I was a little nervous coming into this because I feel like I've been a little bit too close to the ground, both um, in politics and in technology, to have anything profound or sort of um, bigger picture to say. Um, but I've been assured by Yokai that I can just tell horrifying stories about politics and tech and, and everything will be great. So I'm going to tell a, um, a horrifying story about... Uh, Do we all get, get out of jail free cards from Yokai? <laughs> I would like one. Yeah. Um, I, so I took this circuitous route to the West Coast um, from here. I left almost exactly six years ago, the Berkman Center. Um, and had a little uh, stint in Texas that we don't talk about, um, and, <laughs> uh, and dropped out of grad school to join, long story short, join uh, the technology team on President Obama's reelection campaign. So uh, I drove up to Chicago. I actually brought my copy of Wealth of Networks into a uh, campaign office. You're and, such a um, good dork. That's fantastic. You're such a good dork. <laughs> and I got laughed at almost immediately and learned very quickly that um, no one in politics actually cares about theory Reads, or, yeah. yeah, no, they actually, yeah, they read polls, that's about it. Um, uh, eight months into that, so I started very, very early, about 18 months before election day, eight months into the campaign, I moved to San Francisco to open the campaign's technology office. Uh, and the idea was that we were gonna recruit um, uh, the best and brightest minds uh, on the West Coast to supplement our technology team that's based in, in Chicago, and I think, we, there were a lot of, we knew that there were a lot of talented people who were really interested in supporting the reelection effort, but were not willing to give up uh, their jobs and take a drastic pay cut and move to Chicago for a few months. So we decided we would go to them. And this was uh, the first time anyone had done this in political uh, history, and, and we had no idea how it was going to work out. And I landed there, as it happens, just as SOPA and PIPA, the, the SOPA and PIPA victory uh, tour was happening and everyone's very satisfied with themselves and I think um, I came at this moment where my job was to recruit technologists to sort of use their skills for um, the public good at least what I thought was the public good um, and uh, they were also sort of at like coming to this realization that they had real political power at that time and I remember uh, realizing at that moment that this was the first time they were coming, having that epiphany, that they had any political power. And I had spent eight years here, um, and I feel like we all thought that they all knew that there were people in DC who were making all of these decisions that were really life and death decisions for this industry, and they really had no idea. Um, and I just, it just kind of blew my mind how isolated uh, the tech industry was, given how pervasive it was, and how democratizing it was, and how we all thought it was going to change the world. Um, and I think that was sort of the, the seed for what has become the work that I do now, which is very much 
a realization that none of, the, none of this power dynamic is gonna change unless we change who not just uses the tools, but who builds the tools. And, and um, right now, uh, that world is extremely, I can't, I, I know this is a loaded term, but I can't think of a better term to describe it. It's extremely inbred. And um, scientists know what happens when inbreeding goes on for too long. Um, and, and that's a real danger. It's a danger if we, if we are thinking about what um, the future of innovation is and what the future of, of democracy is if the people who have control of um, not just the wealth but the, the, the 21st century means of production um, is held in such a very few mostly rich, mostly white and Asian, mostly male hands. Awesome. Well, that is a yeah, horror me. story that we'll have to pick up on <laughs> in important ways. Tie it all together. <laughs> I offered to go last. That's true. That's true. So Jonathan Zittrin, you are someone here who no, needs literally no introduction. You are one of the co-founders of the Berkman Center. Of course, you are the, uh, the faculty chair of the Berkman Center. These days, you are my teacher here. I owe enormous enormous debts to you of many, many kinds. Um, I don't think I need to tee you up in any way to, to uh, bring this particular part together. So over to you. Thank you, John. And thank you for your invitation to us to think uh, longitudinally about the history of uh, this center and, and what's been going on. And I can't help but think outside in the uh, foyer there, there's all sorts of quotes selected from different people about law and justice. and as this was being built and designed, uh, our Dean, Martha, reached out to say, can you think of any quotes that have an internet piece to it? And you'll see right outside that door is a quote from John Perry Barlow, uh, former lyricist for the Grateful Dead, Wyoming cattle rancher and breeder. Um, and uh, Why did you turn to Catherine? When you, anyway, I won't ask. Well, she was talking about inbreeding. Inbred. Oh, inbred. Oh, thank yeah. you. Very good. <laughs> Helpful. She asked me to link it up. <laughs> and she conceded to my going last, you so did. it's working out very well. <laughs> and uh, John Perry, perhaps after... Hey, he left out his most important credential. Well, what would that be? Berkman Fellow. A Berkman Fellow, our first Berkman Fellow. Yeah. Really? Along and with Alex McGilbray and others, right? That's true. Yeah. One of our first Berkman Fellows. The, the first, first says Charlie. Fellow. Again, like twins being born, who came a little bit ahead. <laughs> and uh, he even gave to us, on a, a special occasion, a physical hard drive containing all of his email which um, we then squirreled away in the library. But we're looking forward to that sort of unearthing. Of, and nobody uh, has bashed it with a hammer, right? Nobody <laughs> has bashed it with a hammer, and the librarians don't take kindly to that. And some things don't change. But John Perry, perhaps after having consumed some prohibited substances uh, in Davos, Switzerland in 1998, wrote something called a Declaration of the Independence of Cyberspace. And uh, he framed it a little bit after the American Declaration of Independence. And it said, uh, as I recall, um, governments of the industrial world, you weary giants of flesh and steel, we come from cyberspace, the home of mind. And on behalf of the future, we ask you of the past, leave us alone. <laughs> and it was this sort of libertarian cri de coeur that was in its way, the starting gun for a celebration of what Yochai later described so wonderfully as the networked public sphere in which you didn't need to have the funneling function of government to provide the public forums, the, the facilities by which to distribute pamphlets, that we'd be able to talk to one another and uh, let things go. And that that was a very important thread in thinking about the public sphere and in fact celebrating it, that then as we sort of leveled up and hit the next phase of the development of the mainstreaming of the internet, things got more complicated. And it took a while to realize it. And it's, it's very telling, Zainab's story of Twitter versus Facebook, that unfiltered feed can be so liberating, and then there's this moment where the second order effects start to come in, and everybody realizes this is an unfiltered feed. I'm going to start putting my ads for a Rolex watch in there, or I'm going to start 
making as if I am an activist when in fact I'm the government. And uh, then you wonder, well, who will govern the space or how are we supposed to navigate it? And I think Alex McGillivray, second fellow at the Berkman Center, uh, no, never a fellow. Never too late, Alex. Not Talk to us after the program. <laughs> and uh, Alex, one of our star students and alums, uh, went on to, among other things, job at Twitter as its general counsel, and I think has been quoted, this is your chance to correct the record, as having said he comes from the free speech wing of the free speech party, dot, 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 let the tweets flow. And that has been sorely tested over time, because if we want broad-based participation in the public sphere, a kind of opportunity for everybody to have a seat at that table, and we believe that dialogue is improved the more that people who have different views talk to one another, it calls to mind Terry Fisher's uh, developing theories of semiotic democracy, having a chance to own the concepts that define our world. It's, a, it's another aspect, actually, I think, of Joe Nye's soft power, which in its initial definition was basically the power of Hollywood and the way in which that is an ambassador for us around the world in a way that maybe a tank or arms sales, complementary at least, and possibly a good substitution. Um, but that it's, it's not actually who owns, who's allowed to use a word on pain of copyright infringement, although that has been a big part of the history and the fights, but rather just who feels as if he or she can participate without being driven out, whether by vitriol, by doxing, just daring to stick your head up and say, hey, here's a view I hold, what can come back at you? Thinking about the free speech implications, both for that individual and for the dialogue we so much want to encourage, that is the hangover after the initial round of celebration that marked probably the first five to 10 years of the development of the internet. And I think at this moment, if I had to kind of put a bookmark in here, so when we come back, should we come back in about 15 years and see mm -hmm. where, where we're at, it's have we, how have we solved the problem of eliciting contribution from as many corners as possible and encouraging it while being able to figure out when voices should be excluded, when behaviors should be ruled out of bounds, and whether it's traditional sovereigns that should hold that power as they have, or whether it is a form of self-governance as yet to be determined. I think about the battles over ICANN to have several United States senators telling us this week that the future of the internet depends on a Department of Commerce memorandum of understanding with a California nonprofit. It strikes me as unlikely, but <laughs> we digress. Um, but the real fight then is governments governing, self-governance, whatever that might look like, algorithmic governance, somehow setting up a program and letting it just decide, and corporate governance. I mean, it's weird to see some of these big issues basically being a customer service issue for a Twitter or a Facebook. And believe me, I sympathize with them. They're like, they don't know what to do. I, what are they supposed to do? When are they supposed to be deciding who can speak and who can't when in essence at the moment they're one of a handful of gatekeepers? So these are problems that uh, as an intellectual matter are fascinating because nobody has it solved. No one has figured this out. Uh, but my hope is that with the kinds of folks in this room and connected uh, uh, virtually through our paths, we have a good shot at experimenting with different solutions, being able to weigh them uh, with enough distance from it that if they're not working, even if we propose them, we'd say like, let's never speak of this again. <laughs> or even write it up and say, we tried it, it didn't work. And uh, to iterate towards something that people really feel identity with and a part of rather than just these technologies appear on their doorstep and they look to see whether version seven is much different from version six and kind of go on their way. That's, that's kind of my greatest hope for this sphere, that there's much democracy and participation in the framing of the code and the governance as there is just in the content of a given conversation that it facilitates. 
Wonderful, Jonathan. Thank you. I think that is the perfect segue in a participatory mode to turn to all of you. I think David Weinberger may have once described this group as the group formerly known as the audience. Is that right? So but they're, they're, <laughs> we have such brilliance in this room. If you have thoughts, comments, questions, the mics are coming around. And if they're not immediately, I will. Can I actually ask um, Alex a question? You can. Put Look at you that. right on the spot. <laughs> First of all, I should have call qualified. Call him AMAC, please. I don't sorry? recognize him if people don't call him AMAC. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Alex McGillivray, would you like to introduce yourself? Uh, sure. Hey, uh, I'm Alex, uh, but most people call me AMAC uh, because that was my email <laughs> handle. But uh, I was one of the first students of the Berkman Center and uh, probably have benefited more than almost anybody here uh, from the wonderfulness of the center. Uh, a bunch of us are tied for that AMAC, I think. So, so happy uh, that the clients have chosen to continue that and to make it something that will happen for generations uh, more. So thank you. Um, well, importantly, what you didn't say is that you, you were one of like the very, um, I guess you were the exception to the rule of smart people in Silicon Valley who actually thought about this stuff. And I think we had this warped perception because you and Andrew McLaughlin used to come back all the time um, and like put forward these hard problems. And that gave me this sense that everyone in San Francisco in tech was thinking about these things as hard as you guys were. Um, and I guess I should have known that because you were flying all the way across the country to have these conversations, <laughs> which should have been a clue that they weren't happening in San Francisco. So I should make that qualification that there were a few of you who were thinking this stuff through at the time at Twitter. Um, and you have made the trip back East, so we kind of look like that. And I'm wondering if you have a similar experience of sort of crossing the country and being horrified by what you found on the other side. Uh, well, I'm so uh, sad that I chose to stand up because my back was hurting. <laughs> <laughs> Watch out, never, all of you around I the edge. I'll never do that again in this crowd. Um, uh, so, uh, um, uh, uh, my current gig is with the U.S. government. I work in the White House doing tech policy. Um, and uh, I have found it to be, I, 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 I'm a fairly optimistic person, I would say. So I, uh, um, I found it to be great. Like I, I really found it to be very welcoming of the tech perspective and um, completely engaged in the harder uh, problems, um, as uh, Catherine was saying. Um, so I, I don't see as much of that disjoint. Um, there's definitely places you go where people might not know the way things are done in different, like in the, on the West Coast or here at Harvard. Um, but that's a total advantage to those of us who have been around uh, because you can appear really smart just by saying things that are pretty basic and from, the other, um, from the other side. Um, but yeah, I, haven't, I, I have found at least uh, within my current role that the, the receptiveness to trying to do things differently um, even to the word disruption within government um, is a is great, um, and uh, and I would I would also say I, 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 um, and I'd love your thoughts on this. I've always felt that the that the engineers that I talked to back west had a really well developed sense of uh, morality and ethics. Um, it's just they didn't necessarily see that as applying to anything that they were doing at the time. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, when Napster came out, you talked to students and they would be like, well, you know, I only download uh, artists that have already made lots of money. Like, they have this whole um, <laughs> uh, very complicated uh, sense of how, why the, how they're doing it in a, in a moral way. And I, I feel like a lot of engineers are that way. Um, and so my, my question is not necessarily like, how do we bring them, how do we bring people to the moral, ethical, hard questions? But how do we awaken them to the fact that the stuff that they're doing right now, it has that uh, that part, um, and, um, and I think that's that's something that that is hard, and, um, and I think is really benefited from the work that you're doing to bring a lot more diverse sets of views into the building and creation of these technologies. Well, I, am I supposed to answer? That? Yeah, go. Oh. I think it was back to you for sure. Okay. Um, so I will say that when, after that uh, kind of first realization about how isolated um, Silicon Valley, metaphysical Silicon Valley was from um, 
kind of the rest of the world, uh, I had the task of trying to recruit a bunch of these people to help build uh, the campaign's digital infrastructure. And I was really scared that no one was going to sign up. I mean, we had no way to know how much energy there was. So we actually went very quickly to the opposite problem of not having enough work for the hundreds of people who raised their hands to do. And I was, I, I would say probably by the end of it, we got mid six figures worth of engineering time out of the set of developers who just wanted to help get the president reelected. Um, some of them quit their jobs and moved to Florida for the end of the campaign. I mean, it was uh, pretty heartening to see. So I would say that there's a lot of, um, you know, I think that the moral compass is there. It's just they don't know what they don't know. And that's where isolation becomes a real problem. So when there aren't people in the room who can ask questions or say, you know, maybe we shouldn't put that filter on Snapchat because it's kind of racist. Like, no one says that because they're not in the room. And those, you know, how do you have a, um, a moral, you know, these questions about, uh, conversations about these big moral questions when everyone in the room thinks the same thing that you do. It's very hard to come to any sort of governance structure that's gonna work for everybody um, if, that's, if those are the people around the table. Anybody else like to jump in? Dean Minow. Well, this is a feast, and I can't resist asking for some predictions. Uh, there was Arab Spring, and then there was shutdown. Yeah. There was freedom, and then there was enclosure. There was it's all free, and then there's tolls. There was the future of the internet and how to stop it. And then there was, you know, can we have global networks that are networking the centers of people that are doing networks? I'd like some, pre some predictions. Uh, Twitter, as I understand it, is the front lines of trying to deal with violent extremism at this moment. Um, the United States government buys the data sets from all of the internet providers. What's, the, what's your prediction here? And what's your prediction particularly about uh, public discourse, democracy, access? I think Zainab has yeah, so the first the voice, and then let's <laughs> add So I study network social movements. That's something I do. I've you know, studied the Arab uprisings. I was at Tahrir Square. I studied the Gezi Park protests, many others. And I think um, the interesting thing is how the unintended consequences um, are surprising. To give you sort of the snapshot of what I think right now, which is plug forthcoming book, uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> is that I think the network public sphere gave these movements this enormous ability to organize quickly and at scale. And which was very empowering. You know, people who had no voice otherwise kind of could get together very quickly. And I saw this again and again. And they came together in a very participatory ethos. I mean, John Perry would have been proud of their ethos. And that ethos goes back to the 60s movements. Say the Port Huron statement from the 60s would have been very much home in Tahrir Square. We want to do this. But the culture of this wanting voice and getting that voice very quickly, and also using that voice to organize logistically, they took the organizational, the communication networks became organization networks. And I watched these young people perform amazing feats of organization. The problem was, and I couldn't have foreseen this, and I don't think anybody could have, maybe somebody could have, but I didn't, was that when you scale up so quickly, it's very hard to go into your very first curve organizationally at 100 miles an hour. And especially if you're coming from a very participatory moment, what happens is all the participation without infrastructure for decision making paralyzes the movement. So they have tactical freeze. They can go to Tahrir and they can never figure out because they first came together that day. So doing things the harder, older way, ironically, meant that they had all this how to work together built up that in the very first curve, the first 
challenge they faced wasn't when everything was at stake. They had built that up together. Now, what does this mean for the future of these movements? It doesn't mean that they're destined to do this. It also doesn't mean that they should go back to doing you know, leafletting instead of Twitter, because that's nonsense, right? It's not the thing. What I'm seeing is this incredible awareness in many social movements that this was their problem that the participation and the scaling up very quickly. It's almost like a startup that scales up very quickly, but instead of a VC to come rescue, you got a government coming after you. That is not a good place to be at 100 miles an hour. And Gezi Park protests zero to 100 miles in two days. That power turned out to be a weakness. Uh, the reflection and this kind of analysis of I sometimes liken it to climbing up Mount Everest, but a Sherpa's carrying your oxygen tank. Sounds great, unless you run into trouble, and then you're not a mountaineer. Somebody helped you up. Internet was our Sherpa. And then we ran into problems that you run into above 8,000 meters, uh, and we weren't mountaineers, because that was our very first mountain. The understanding of this makes me hopeful because I hear this reflected back. It's not just my analysis. I hear this perspective reflected back through social movement people around the world who've been through two waves now with the, um, the, the Seattle WTO movements and all of that, and now this two ways. So I think there's maturity in saying, let's figure out how to also make decisions together and do the sort of long-term work together but also use these tools, because going back to the old tools isn't um, the thing. The unfortunate thing here is what people have alluded to, which is for my part of the world, is that when you have authoritarianism kind of dispersed quickly, but without intermediary institutions that we've built in you know, Europe, it took hundreds of years. I lived in Belgium in a town where the Germans had massacred the town inhabitants twice within living memory. So it wasn't like Europe was very easy. But they built from that destruction. The Middle East, I think, never had the chance to go from you know, knocking over authoritarianism to building institutions. And in that vacuum, we saw extremism like ISIS jump up and use the same tools. And it was surreal to me. I found myself discussing with my friends at Google, because of YouTube, where I had spent many years discussing how not to censor activist videos, we found ourselves discussing what to do about beheading videos that were produced to go viral. And I was like, this is surreal. Like, how are we discussing this? But that's where we are. Am I hopeful or not? I'm hopeful that there's a lot more understanding. I'm not as hopeful because it's moving very fast and very wrapped up, so. Um, Zainab, thank you. We look forward to your forthcoming book for more on little all plug, that, for but sure. Yeah. I'd be very interested in additional predictions. One thing I might pull out of Dean Minow's comment, which was in part about you know, going from openness and all the excitement that I certainly think all of us who were near the Berkman Center at the beginning felt as the predominant kind of hope, right, with, with the internet, to a period of various forms of enclosure. The other thing that's happened, of course, is that authoritarians and others who are acting against the will of the people are using the tools themselves, both to put out propaganda, as you know, but also to practice surveillance at a very, very large scale. Um, and it seems to me that one of the predominant changes has been the extent to which these are actually very dangerous tools in that way, particularly for activists, and particularly when we look at a wide range of people using the tools, the least sophisticated users are in real peril by virtue of using them and not really understanding them as well. So in some of these predictions, I'd be interested if that, that surveillance question might actually might factor in as well. Uh, it was certainly going to be a, a big part of what I wanted to talk about. So um, predictions are hard, particularly about the future, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, predictions also assume a certain uh, a fairly deterministic and, and at least predictable set of interactions, and I would resist that. I think it's more a question of threat models and competing threat models. So Jonathan put on the table the threat model of the mob, the, the censorship of the uh, Gamergate, of the, of the mob responding. We have the concern with cyber terrorism. We have all sorts of uh, a threat model that's about the distribution of power. Um, and I worry about that threat model because 
to me, the threat model is much, remains much more concentrated power than decentralized power, and concentrated power both in the state and in the market. And the problem we've seen is that repeatedly, um, a, a generation that imagined that government could function fully well in the Keynesian era uh, gets replaced by a generation that believes in self-regulating markets and ends up crashing and burning. And we're in a moment where, uh, and for a very brief period maybe, John Perry Barlow's ideal of, of uh, uh, anarchism uh, being able to be a functional political program, as Evan Moglen put it in 99, um, seems to have crashed and burned on precisely the, the shoals of what Zainab described for uh, the Arab Spring. It's the, the impossibility of pure structuralism. We have people working, the Primavera working on blockchain and the ways in which the failure of full structurelessness actually to function under these conditions. So we have this persistent sense of imperfect systems and we have to understand the threat model. But you talked about surveillance in, author in authoritarian countries and uh, we're in a post-Snowden era, unless you're describing us as an authoritarian country. Could be us country. too, yeah. Surveillance and control pervade our lives, whether it's controlled by private companies and the idea of the market or whether it's public company uh, or whether it's the public uh, and the space. Zainab has a great paper on combining these uh, capabilities together for how essentially uh, the political system gets uh, 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 framed and controlled. So when you say, how do I project the future? I can imagine a class of threats that combine high degrees of surveillance and control by states that find their legitimation from fears of cyber terrorism and cyber crime uh, that end up converting a network into one that has relatively few affordances to actually act and mobilize and speak by comparison to what's possible in order to be able to control them, but at the same time reports on its users to a central uh, actor, either to control their actions and mobilizations or to uh, control their purchasing behavior. And all of this legitimated within the constraints of you're getting what you want in the market and you're getting the security you want from the state under conditions that are tightly controlled. I think that's an entirely plausible pathway. I also see a plausible pathway where we do actually solve some of these problems, where we uh, commit politically, morally to that being the solution and we try to build uh, models of governance that actually try to leverage the advantages and overcome the limitations of each of these. So if you look at Susan's beautiful talk, Susan Crawford's beautiful talk this afternoon about cities and responsive communities, a lot of it sounds like just back to a government providing everything. But then you look inside and you see uh, how much of the work is about actually moving some things over to social provisioning, something over to market provisioning, resisting what she's calling the, the urban intelligence industrial complex that's purely based in market, but also uh, not completely relying on one. So building those kinds of models, building the kinds of models that connect with technology to actual self-governance, those are the models of governance that I could imagine work out. Um, but I do, I do think that the core question of whether the threat model is the power of distributed networks that are unruly or the power of concentrated concentrations of power that use network surveillance and platform design to control people around the network is the core question. And the more we're willing to buy the story of the other, the cyber terrorist, the immigrant, and the criminal, uh, the more we'll be willing to concentrate power in nation states controlling these systems, the more we'll be willing to rely on single companies that will control our data and keep us secure and satisfied, and in fact, the more brittle and susceptible to control we'll end up with the system. Wow. Other predictions? Jonathan, looks like you're stepping up to the mic. Well, uh, I confess that lately, Yochai's threat model of centralized control has been on my mind. I'm not sure why, as November 
mirrors. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, and it is a reminder that technologies that are so powerful and so beneficial with just a small tweak in the surrounding environment can be amazingly intrusive and uh, uh, negative for us. And thinking about how to tyrant proof in the centralized models, threat model, um, the tools we've built to create a safe society to solve crimes and other problems, uh, that's one of the things I think we are working on. And uh, it, it, you, know, you do wonder how Richard Nixon might have fared if he were uh, at his most paranoid and worried today and in office with the tools uh, at his disposal. Um, I guess if I had to write a sequel to the future of the internet and how to stop it today, it might be, well, we tried. Um, and so luckily I don't. I still want to think of the wheel as spinning. I told you so. Is that another <laughs> alternative? <laughs> Please shut the door on your way out. Yeah. Um, but it also is a reminder that complementing all of the focus on the technologies themselves and even on governance structures is just thinking about the people that on which they operate and from whom we are expecting contribution. And there you have to play a really long game. And it's, it's why when I look at the work that Sandra is doing on youth and media or Leah Plunkett is doing about kids and their relationship to this, thinking about even how in the public school system where, and, and elsewhere in schooling that nobody feels as if he or she has figured that piece out, how to have engaging in civil and civic discourse, how to meet somebody that you disagree with and not immediately think it has to become as it would be between sports teams, a battle just between fans that's not like you're ever gonna reconcile the Oakland Raiders and the Pittsburgh Steelers. You can't have them have a summit and finally bury their, uh, uh, their dispute. I mean, that's, like the, that's a feature, not a bug. But we shouldn't think of that in the marketplace of ideas. And I worry about the, the neoliberal project of actually welcoming disagreement and having a way to process it. That requires tending. And a number of us I know here have been charmed and astounded by Wikipedia that it even exists. It you know, works in practice, but not in theory. And uh, it's it now is the a, time for your bumblebee metaphor. Dad. That's right. Yeah. right now. <laughs> Incorporate by reference. <laughs> but um, that is exceptional, and even it may not persist. And trying to take that apart and put it back together so we understand some of the secret sauce seems to me part of the long game we need to play to have a populace mm -hmm. that will make the most of of what there is to offer. And I don't even think it's just a mob, although that has its own threats. When one individual can create sock puppets and with a little skill be in effect a mob, you, you can't have that as the, uh, the ship that the convoy will have to go at. And I, I think it's actually why I look at um, Intasar's project too, taking uh, a, a body of material that is in part an oral tradition, uh, not a written one, and being able to reduce it to a format that people can engage with and talk to one another about seems to me such a great example of how to move a project like this along. Um, and I would think that there'd correspondingly in its way be a chance, I'd, I'd love to persuade J.K. Rowling to um, put into the public domain book one of Harry mm. Potter. There's still six, like, you know, first mm -hmm. one is free and then you get hooked. And make it so that that first book is something that students in fourth, fifth, sixth grade could do incredible exegesis upon with no intellectual property barriers and get into the kinds of debates that we get into over other materials uh, as a way of, of finding the joy in public participation in a network sphere. I hear that Yale University Press did pretty well on both of your books, despite their both being available online, right? So that's true. JK Rowling they, uh, might, might also get your level of sales. Yes, we don't excited. have the counterfactual, but yes, they did okay. <laughs> Dean, uh, oh, sorry, um, sorry, okay. Just, just, I, just, yeah. just, just them's fighting words when you say, "Will Wikipedia work?" <laughs> um, Jerry we've, still got, we've got <laughs> such a massively successful set of people here around the cooperation group. Uh, that have come now for a decade 
and studied the details of Wikipedia and free software and Sasha sitting there with online cooperatives and um, um, uh, uh, I've been there with open video. I mean, there's just so many people here have worked on the details of making these things work that if there's a hope for actually learning what it means to construct governance on top of an open platform in conversation with market players, when you're talking about uh, um, uh, company-based peer production, Summer here is, is uh, part of the European uh, CBPP project, so is Primavera, um, documenting hundreds or thousands of successful models of provisioning. I was just reading a paper uh, uh, by Vasilis Kostalikis and others about people doing uh, open design on a commons-based production model of prosthetics for 3D printing that are a fraction of the price of the ones that are. This is not a question. It's a massively important research project, but it's not a who knows whether it works. We, I, if anybody knows, we do. If I may, in the... Uh, <laughs> Fighting may, words has ahead. a specific uh, <laughs> meaning in law, but uh, uh, I guess it's less does it work and more I think of the immortal words of Jim Kirk, for how long, Mr. Scott? For how long? <laughs> and it's exactly the research you're averting to that, that says, that points the way towards how to do it. I just, I wouldn't want, and I don't think you would want, to presume that this is a force of nature so powerful that it doesn't need any help to realize itself. No, no question, but you've got our former fellow, Mayo Fuster Morel now, sitting in Barcelona with the city government, building what it means to put Barcelona in the commons, mm -hmm. combining both commons-based production yes. with a municipality. Um, we're building it trying to at least, some of us, um, uh, yeah. and very much in this community. The I think same this government that took Barcelona.com away from its registrant <laughs> through the uh, uniform dispute resolution process <laughs> and uh, claimed it as its own. Okay. I think there's, there is truth. <laughs> yeah, that's good. I think Ikisar wants to speak. She might, but I'm gonna move to the, uh, if you'd like to say something brief and then we'll go, go to the audience. All right, I'll, I'll say something brief yeah, about yeah. predictions yeah. Uh, okay. because my, I mean, my inclination, my first inclination was, is never to predict and it's instead to go to the past as a historian, but I think that they work equally as well and it's for something that Jay-Z said about the people always being at the center, they always have been, and so I think there's no reason to do anything but predict that they always will be when it comes to trying to grapple with some of these big questions about how, well, how do we grapple with the big questions in a collective, collaborative way and, and do what I think Berkman has done very well and, and what makes it such a nice, uh, home or partner for this project on Sharia as well, is to, to do it in a way that targets certain communities of people to engage while being open access or, or open um, opening the conversation to everyone else. But it's gonna be the people, I think, at the core mm. uh, of figuring out the problems of democratizing the information and the conversations and ultimately of figuring out how to govern and and use the information, hopefully, to, to, hmm. toward a better world. It's a great insight. It also, I think, helps bridge and think about how the body of work that Yochai was just referencing in cooperation might be something on which we can build as you build this, this new project. So what a, what a, neat, what a neat thought. Uh, Jonah, you've had the mic for a while. Um, I wonder how much, as we think about predictions, uh, we are being extraordinarily ethnocentric. And if you go back, 20 years to the 90s to John Perry Barlow and also to Bill Clinton's statement that nailing, that the maintaining control of the internet in China will be like nailing jello to a wall. Mm -hmm. And we look at the fact that we talk about a global internet, but in fact China is the largest part of a global internet. And it has in effect nailed jello to the wall and that Barlow's utopianism seems quaint at best, particularly for that part of the world. Mm. 
you predict 20 years ahead? Do you think you were good 20 years ago? Uh, in other words, what it, the view was that sovereign governments couldn't do it. And in fact, the biggest sovereign government, biggest in internet terms, has done it pretty effectively. And it's not the argument that uh, the great firewall uh, can't be breached by VPNs or something. Of course it can. The point is you use social control over corporations plus police control to lock up people who don't, who deviate from that. And you have in China an extremely well-controlled internet. And so as we look to the future, shouldn't we go back to the 90s and ask how good were our predictions? Not for the internet globally, because we're making a mistake to say global, but for the largest piece of the internet, weren't we badly wrong? I suspect any number of you have lots to say. Zainab, do you want to start? And then, yeah, uh, so and Catherine Bracey, you've gotten the mic the least, so if you want to oh. jump in on this one, you can be ready. Well, you don't have to, of course. To, to make even worse, uh, I think it's very important to understand that the governments, especially authoritarian governments, are going to evolve in the space. And what I'm seeing is not just that China has this enormous infrastructure, which not just censors, because censorship isn't their main problem, it uses it as a stabilization mechanism, so there's participation from the public so that it can stabilize itself and not be blindsided, meanwhile effectively curtailing collective action. There's great papers by Gary King on how exactly this works. But that's China, let's say, because it's got a domestic internet that's billion people and all of that. So what does Russia have? What does Turkey have? Well, it turns out that a very good way of censorship is too much information. And this is sort of to add to your threat models, is the central powers using decentralization to confuse and overwhelm the public so that you give up trying to think it's knowable. So the current censorship model I see in these countries like Russia, Turkey, where the cat's out of the bag, you really can't shut the internet down because the e-government of Turkey runs on it. But what they can do is the network public sphere, as soon as there is a claim to something happening, there is this flood of counterclaims that it's a hoax, Every picture from, is from Gaza. There's no other place on the planet. Every picture of government misconduct is not from Turkey. And it is too much information as a method of censorship and targeted drowning and distraction, targeted distraction. So very ironic to me that at this point that we haven't really... Like Clay Shirky had said it, there's a filter problem, not a too much information problem, but we hadn't really figured out 20 years ago that this would become a more effective censorship than actual blocking of the internet because people want to circumvent, they can circumvent. But if you're flooded with 30 pieces of contradictory information with no way to make sense of it, that is very, very effective. And that is a way in which the centralized powers could help us re-decentralize if they were to step up as effective filters, or we could have collective filtering mechanisms to counter this, and that could happen. But it is, it's a threat that I don't think any of us had seen, that too much information itself would be a more effective censorship than unplugging the TV and shutting off the news was. Uh, that's 20th century, and that's there. So. Um, I'm just adding that as a threat model. Other views? I have nothing to say about China. Um, but uh, you know, back to the sort of prediction space, I don't know if this is really a prediction, but it's interesting from my sort of naive outsider point of view, um, why no one in tech or in Silicon Valley or people who are talking about these issues questions the distorting effect of venture capital as sort of the primary economic infrastructural piece for this entire industry. And I feel like you could, um, someone could, who had a lot of time and in a, in a beautiful library and um, research money, could tie back a lot of the problems we see in the industry now to venture capital as sort of the source of the problem. So maybe, um, if we could answer some of those questions, we could do a better job of predicting the future. I think it's crazy, maybe unprecedented in human history that um, Uber 
a venture-backed company who's um, on paper worth many billions of dollars, um, is planning to move um, uh, 3,000 employees, create 3,000 jobs um, in Oakland, where I live, literally across the street from my apartment. And the overriding sentiment is no, don't come. Meanwhile, Oakland is one of the most economically depressed cities in the country. It is insane. I mean, I, someone correct me if I'm wrong, but I've never heard of uh, a city saying don't come to a, a company that was planning to bring 3,000 jobs and untold other sort of indirect economic development to a place. And I think that those kinds of reactions to the economy that is being created by the internet industry um, is something that should give us, uh, that should be a real red flag for us um, as we think about who's left in and who's left out and who has access to this growth um, and, what it, and what kinds of sort of nihilistic um, reactions it might cause for people who don't see it as benefiting them at all. Well, an interesting way to bridge, in a way, your response on the, and the question around ethnocentrism might be also to say, as we think about particular communities, we may think everybody wants job creation, everybody wants new, you know, innovative companies that use technology, and that may not be true in every, every circumstance. Well, everyone wants a, a job. They just don't see this as, a, as a, a, an industry that's going to create anything for them. It's for just going to displace them. My rent went up 20% last month. Um, you know, if you look at someone who's trying to raise a family on... Uh, $80,000 a year even. I mean, you can't afford to um, really build a city. And so there's questions about, you know, how does venture capital incentivize building sustainable growing companies? Like it's no, who, who would ever pass an internet company down to their kids? Like that will never happen. It's just bizarre to even think about. Um, and so what does that mean for the kind of economy that we're creating and how, how sustainable it can be? Okay. I want to come back more directly, perhaps, to uh, there are two aspects to your question, Joe. One is, uh, why believe us now we were so wrong then? And two, um, uh, what about China? Um, and so let me take them both. So the first is, I think the uh, cyberspace is a new space, and it will change everything, was a view in the 90s. Uh, certainly, uh, Charlie and John Perry were sort of central, but it was contested. Um, and it was contested precisely along the question of were there points of control that could be reasserted. And I think so one of the things is research projects, right? Jonathan's work with Ben Edelman, God knows how long ago, the work that John then continued on just mapping the facts. How effective is the censorship? That's the first thing we start to do. And again, this is work here in the center to actually try to test the proposition. Can you or can't you? Does the internet uh, uh, interpret censorship as, as, as damage and route around it or not? And the answer, it turns out, is sort of, kind of, but not really. And it's if you build a system like China does or Saudi Arabia did, you can actually manage it. That was a fact that came out of the research, and I think that's a central commitment we have. Um, but the second point, which is about the, the uh, American centrism of our policy debate, uh, I think has massive implications. And again, I'll go back 19 years, 1998, Eben Moglen, NYU at a conference that I organized, arguing about encryption export controls. Mm -hmm. Talking about the fact that we were doing our policy on clipper chip and encryption export controls, ignoring the fact that these communications were going to protect people who otherwise would have their fingernails torn down, as he used that metaphor. I still remember it 19 years later. The fact that our debate over encryption and surveillance and policing ignores the fact that if we force by design our companies to design visible technologies, breakable technologies, the millions of people who will be put under a boot for longer than necessary doesn't come into our conversation is a travesty. We have real choices. We have choices between focusing on information security, on resilience and robustness of systems, and on policing through visibility. There are plausible arguments to be made, but we don't make the argument that if we focus on making it possible for the FBI to read everything, and that's the thing we lean on, we're also making it possible for China to keep its framework and for other countries mm -hmm. in the world, particularly at the time when we're seeing that democracy is in such a crisis. 20 years ago, maybe you could have still been optimistic 
You look at Latin America, you look at Central and Eastern Europe, uh, you look at uh, um, uh, India, you, it looks like things are going in the right way. Today, between Brexit and the Trump campaign, between the breakdown of the Shenzhen project and the rise of the, rise of the Swedish Democrats, that alone Le Pen or alternative for Deutschland, we don't know that that's where we're going. It's irresponsible for us not to think of those terms when we are regulating so the FBI can tweak here and there under what is potentially at least a reasonably law and order system. Senator. Can I? Um, fighting words maybe for you, but um, so one thing I maybe it's from what part of the world I am uh, watching sort of the Middle East and disintegration. And I have been saying, and I'm a very much a First Amendment person as the planet goes, I'm probably in the 1% of people who believe in it. But I think the First Amendment looks really nicer when you've got Canada up north and Mexico down south and two oceans <laughs> than uh, in the middle of a civil war with ethnic cleansing being organized online. And we've seen this happen again and again. And a lot of times, so we're seeing this in Burma now, which we had this authoritarian regime fall apart, no intermediary institutions. And if you ever thought that no, a religion was totally immune to this kind of stuff. It's extremist Buddhist monks organizing mostly on Facebook because that is the network public sphere here. It's just kind of, I can't believe I'm saying these sentences to be honest. Um, and there's been four to 800 deaths in the past year. Uh, it's the biggest source of refugee outflow in Southeast Asia right now. Oh, I can't run the counterfactual, but Facebook's a major part of what's going on because we have people without the digital literacy or literacy, and things go viral, and it's like the anti-Semitism of the 30s, the crazy stories go viral, the Rohingya are eating your children stories. It's on Facebook, people are like, it must be true. And they are now all networked, and these phones are, you know, Chinese $30 phones in everybody's hands. And I'm not sure, like, this is the First Amendment framework doesn't work because you do have, and I think even if it was in the United States, it wouldn't work, right? Because this is incitement to violence, very clear. But it starts before that, right? It starts, before, it starts with the hate speech, which we would be okay with because, you know, we're the United States and we've got Canada and we've got Mexico. But there, without the intermediary institutions, the, the transition from authoritarianism to the free willing network. Uh, sphere has come with this enormous problem. I was just speaking to Facebook people and I was saying, look, this is, you know, forget everything else, the quarterly earnings or whatever, this is going to go down in history as a potential, like the way Radio Rwanda is in Rwanda's history. And I, you know, who knows, maybe there's two people in Facebook who are in the India office who's looking after five countries and one of them is Burma, and who's looking at this? I'm just trying to raise this for the complication. On the other hand, I've spent my whole life opposing government censorship and corporate censorship of speech, and here I am giving this very complicated story of right to life and right to assembly is perhaps is going to trump, but who's going to decide this, right? There's no Burmese government you can count on on this. Uh, as I said, I don't know if this is, a, that this is what I was trying to talk about with Facebook people saying you've got to prioritize this. Maybe they will. So that's why we need research centers to think about these things, and engage people. And maybe in the these only positive topics. thing I can say here is that the more we know, the more we can actually say, look, this is happening, and even if we don't have an answer, because there's no answer I can propose from my back pocket that I'd be very happy with. But then again, there is, you know, the big 800 people dead and the biggest refugee outflow in that part of the world is Facebook driven. So I have one last question I'd like to ask, but are any reactions to this question before, before we do? Thank you. Um, so the last question I'd love to have everybody take a crack at is we have this amazing opportunity, thanks to the Klein family and the Berkman family, to continue this work for the next whatever it might be. And this is, I just think, such a, such a great luxury that here we're able to bring together this community and to study it. And I think one of the things that animates each of our work is thinking about hard problems. What are the hard problems that persist? And you've each surfaced one or more during your time. But I thought we might go down the row and um, maybe we'll, uh, you've just spoken, so maybe we'll end with you, Zainab, and, uh, and start with Jonathan. But what is the hard problem that you most are excited to study in the Berkman Klein Center in the years to come? That's funny. I was going to 
crowdsource that to this uh -huh, audience uh -huh. because already right, everybody in the audience is like, gosh, what would my hard problem be? Yeah. So it's, there should be like cards under the chair or something that you, old tech, you could write on. Um, but we should create Maybe an email address. Twitter hashtags? We yeah, do, something yeah. like that uh, to get it going. But certainly lately, uh, and it does just tee right into what we've been talking about, this field awkwardly named algorithmic accountability. And I actually saw Zainab talking with um, one of our more colorful and famed cryptographers about how to rename the field. <laughs> like algorithm is not the right word and accountability isn't the right word, but other than that, it's great. Uh, but this field in which we are going to, in the name of efficiency, in the name of what great features it can give us, in the name of defeating or solving the filter problem, uh, we're going to be turning over to code and learning code, no less, um, a lot of control to advise us, to shape our day, to shape our lives, what jobs we get, uh, where we might go. And uh, there is currently no easy model that even exists on which to pattern how that should work or what boundaries, if any, to set. And none of us, I don't think, is terribly excited about you know, cranking out some regulation that gets agreed to when we think we're done. Um, but it doesn't make the problem go away not to do anything either. And I will be the last person not to appreciate just how quickly the technology moves and to celebrate that. Uh, but this is one of those instances where being able at least to gather data, to know what's happening, and to iterate quickly uh, as we see problems come up has got to be vital. And that is a big, big project uh, in this, as Charlie calls it, rhetorical space uh, for the next interval. Awesome. Catherine Bracey. Um, all of the problems I can think of are actually human problems and not technology problems, which is maybe the point. But um, I really think if we're going to figure out this, you know, really crack this um, question around whether the internet can realize its democratic potential, um, you know, I've spent the last five years or so working on um, technology to make um, politics more equal. I think what I have come to understand is that we can't address the questions of political inequality without addressing the questions of economic inequality. Um, and that those are uh, really where um, the roots of all of this, uh, these conversations lie. So um, if people are thinking about sort of new um, funding models for uh, the tools that we need or anything like that, I think would be really a uh, great value add to uh, the field. Wonderful. And to Sarah. So I think about uh, the mission that we have is in what seems to be a very narrow area of looking at Islamic law, um, but that ends up being an area of a lot of data. We're talking about 1,400 years and the whole globe. Um, and so part of the mission is to gather that data in a way and make it available in a way that's really accessible and really useful. So one of the big picture problems that I look forward to uh, working with Burke Klein folk on is how do you use technology to, uh, in this era of big data, um, to, to collect that not only to collect the information, but to channel it in a way that people, who after all are at the heart of all this, uh, can use it so that it can be useful and used in ways that are positive and not, uh, not scary, not authoritarian, not life-threatening. Uh, so it's a problem of, uh, it's the big data problem and how do we make it mm. useful and accessible. Wonderful. Okay. Um, Two kinds of answers. Uh, the first is, uh, I think we should commit to not knowing, uh, which is what we've been superb at for 20 years. <laughs> um, because the richness of insight, the sheer joy of ignoring disciplinary boundaries, uh, has, been, has made this community what it is. And, um, uh, uh, if undisciplined as a founder uh, idea is embodied in Charlie, uh, then it is, I think, well embodied um, uh, in this community. 
Uh, and you see it with every year of fellows and as the network uh, continues, this very lightweight network of people coming up with ideas and questions and problems that I had no idea were interesting. And the next year, they're completely indispensable. I think that's what's so beautiful about this place and the way in which it's been independent from the university, but at the same time of it and outside it and as a place for conversation. For myself, I am and will continue to focus on the question of how we spent 40 years creating a deeply unequal economic framework, the extent to which the set of technologies we're beginning to, do, to see from automation and robotics to platforms to big data and, and surveillance uh, uh, to 3D printing will or won't be nudged in a direction of a highly extractive form of capitalism or one that is potentially economically participatory. That's my set of questions, and there are people here I know and love who are working heavily uh, uh, on it, but th that's just me and a bunch of others, and there are many others, and, and we're gonna learn next year and the year after what we are interested in. Keep at it. Say no. I just wanna say yes to everything. <laughs> um, the one challenge that I'm seeing right now emerge very fast is machine intelligence, especially machine learning. Um, it's like software is Moore's Law. Every month I see papers that blow my mind that are building on last month's papers. It's like those early days of microchip uh, miniaturization and we were like, oh, this is gonna change the world and we didn't know. I think we are at such an inflection point with machine intelligence think in three years that's we're going to be just shocked by the things that become very quickly mainstream and they hold such power that the question that you just raised is what kind of an economy are we going to have once we have machine intelligence that is just going like this it's um, I'm not prone to hype on this, I think, uh, so I, I feel safe to say this is happening. And that brings the question that Catherine's been sort of coming back and forth a lot, is who is designing this thing that is so powerful? And by diversity, we don't just mean same kind of people with, you know, just female Stanford CS grads, right? That's not the point is that the very the different life experiences across the socioeconomic spectrum because like driverless cars we're looking at it part of me is thinking great safer the other part of me is this is the employment of last resort to maybe half a billion men on the planet do you really want to unemploy half a billion men in 10 years nothing has ever good come I'm sorry but nothing has mm -hmm. ever come out of mass unemployment of men for whom this is and this is not a joke this is driving is what all immigrants do this is why our taxi drivers are mostly immigrants this is what rural to urban immigrants first job this is a job of last resort to hundreds of millions of people and yes we'll have it safer but what the heck and this is kind of like goes back to the uber argument that you're making how do we envision the power of something like this so that it doesn't take us back to 1935, you know, or 1938 or something like that with this great mass upheaval. Rather, we look at it as how does it become distributive in a very different way because there are all these alternative possibilities I can go John Perry Barlow on, but where's the politics of it? And who's at the table discussing the technology part of it while designing it? So much to do. So. so much to do, and a great platform to do it on. I have kept class over for about eight minutes. I'm very sorry about that, but I would love to just end with one reflection and then one further big round of thank yous. Um, the reflection is really just thinking about these the two great questions that have animated a lot of this discussion about our, uh, how did we get it wrong on China, as it were, and, and predicting the future, and the kinds of tools, really, that we would bring to that, that conversation. It seems to me, actually, though we may have gotten it wrong in the front end, or at least contested in a certain way in the front end, I actually think we know a fair amount now about how China, or Russia for that matter, or Turkey on its worst days, or Iran, controls the space, which is a lot of things, right? They use technology that we, of course, have now figured out empirically how that happens. 
We know that it happens with lots of humans, to Catherine Bracey's point, that it's sometimes the grandmother on the corner or it's the person who's quietly in the employee um, who's working in the um, in the, the internet cafe, particularly in Turkey, one of the things that they set up, an enormous amount of surveillance added to that and so forth. And I think that the way in which we've come to that understanding, and I think the way we've come to the richness of many of these questions, is by bringing a whole bunch of different lenses to this question. And those lenses, I think, are in part from people's backgrounds and, and where we've come from, but also in the context of a university and in the context of scholarship, it's because we have people who have come at this from different disciplinary backgrounds and different uh, traditions of how to ask the question. And Yochai often thinks about, have we interpreted this in such a way that it means that we've come up with a new microscope? Have we found new ways to ask and answer questions? And when I think of the gift that the Berkman family and the Klein family have given us, it really is the chance to work with so many people layered in this rich and complex and interesting way, some of whom are based here in the zip code, some of whom are all over, some in the White House, some in, you know, all over the world in so many different roles and in the network of centers that URSA has created. That really, I think, is the genius and the wonder of what we're able to do um, and that, gift, that, that which this gift makes possible. It's great to be interdisciplinary in this university, but it's really great, I think, to be in this complicated, networked, public forum of research and inquiry that is just such a fun thing to be able to be a part of. So um, I'm so grateful that we have a chance to explore this and celebrate it. I'd like to end with one big round of applause. And there are three things I want to have as part of our thank you. Um, one, of course, is once again to the uh, Klein family. Secondly is the amazing Berkman staff arrayed around the edge. You all know if you work in this environment, what a treat it is to have the, those who work under the roof of 23 Everett Street and around. I, I was just going to say, too, in 20 years, I don't think I've ever seen them in business attire. This is incredible. I know. It's, I didn't recognize particularly Adam Holland. Whoa, that, it's impressive to see him. <laughs> <laughs> uh, to, to tease you a little bit, um, and of course to our panel, a big thank you. Thank you all for being here. Thank you, John.